to come could. So, uh, hi. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, building a custom LLM um, and taking that to a new market uh, and what that really means. So, firstly, um, hi, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm not from around these parts, as you might be able to tell from my accent, um, but uh, lovely to be in Austin, lovely to be in the US. Um, I lead data and engineering uh, at Bud. Um, we sort of work with generally sort of large enterprise financial institutions um, to enrich financial data uh, and then provide that way back in a way that's actionable and useful. So affordability assessments or in-app uh, consumer engagement and improving that experience um, or understanding your customer base better to cross-sell, upsell, and so on. Now, in this talk, um, I'll be talking about something we did uh, in terms of building an LLM for transaction AI, so looking at individual transactions um, and trying to categorize those, um, and then how we sort of took that to new markets. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to hear more about what we do at Bud, what we do with those categorized transactions, or the other things we do other than categorization, then definitely come chat to me afterwards or chat to the folks over at the booth. So to start, um, I'll give a little bit of context as to what it really means to build an LLM to uh, uh, categorize financial transactions and what that means, um, and the architecture there. Then we'll sort of have a look at what it really means and what's the task that we're trying to do? What does like taking something to a new market involve? What are some of the challenges in doing that? Um, and then throughout the talk, I'll be talking about some of the things that we've done, both in how we initially trained our LLM, but also in how we uh, look to take that into new markets and some of the challenges there um, and some of the techniques that we found. So what's our goal? The goal is categorization of financial transactions. So what does that really mean? So when you have a financial transaction, uh, there are numerous sort of different, uh, you call them, we call them features um, to a transaction. So some of them are nice and structured, like an amount or a transaction type, like a, a debit card transaction, credit card transaction, or a bank transfer. Um, but then you also normally have this thing called a transaction description, um, which is uh, sometimes really simple. Sometimes it's just a merchant's name, um, but often it's much more complicated than that. Sometimes it has all of these little bits of data um, that are, it looks sort of semi-structured, but the structure changes, so you can't rely on it. You don't necessarily know what the different pieces of information in, inside that transaction description are. We take those different features, um, and then we categorize that transactions. And at Bud, we do that in three different levels, um, so different levels of granularity. Um, but essentially, it's, it's doing classification. So. How, how, how does this work? How, does, uh, how do we sort of build that LLM? The first and the most important thing, before you start doing anything, before you start figuring out how am I going to build this solution, before you start thinking about RNNs and transformer models and architectures and solutions and everything else, is figuring out what you're trying to do. So when you're doing classification, categorization, the most important thing is trying to figure out, well, what are your categories? What are you actually trying? What does your output look like? So in this instance, we're thinking about a taxonomy. So essentially a list of categories like utilities or energy or uh, groceries and so on and so forth. And the design of your taxonomy has massive consequences on your quality, your usability, your flexibility, like how you can use this. Um, and it's actually surprisingly hard. Once you've kind of got your taxonomy, the second thing to think about is what are the different things that you have uh, and pieces of information that you have about the thing that you're trying to categorize or trying to classify. So in this instance, it's a financial transaction, and that's the sort of the entity that we're trying to classify. But we have a number of different pieces of information or features about that transaction. So I talked about this transaction description, which in turn contains lots of various different and varying different pieces of information. But you'll also have other things such as like the amount, for example, or was it a credit or debit transfer? Was it an incoming or outgoing transaction? And so on and so forth. So you've got to understand what those features are. In this instance, all of those features are going to be uh, enums. So they'll be sort of one of a sort of set of defined values. There'll be a number or an amount, or there'll be a string. But if you're thinking about something more multimodal, you could be having images, you could be having other things. And again, these all have to impact how you go about this process. 
So, in terms of um, the, the model architecture that we're kind of going to be looking at today, the first thing is uh, description processing. So, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on most today is that how we how we deal with that description, and, and that's because that's the most important and diff most difficult thing to actually uh, take into a new market. Um, but so we'll do some processing on the description. Um, we'll do some processing on each of the other features. Um, and what you're doing there is you're trying to get a representation uh, that's useful to you. So it's really not helpful to have like the words British gas, like a, a classification model can't do much with that. Um, in the same way that you, you know, an amount or so on and so forth, these aren't useful things. Um, and computers, they don't like words, right? They, they, they like numbers. So essentially you're trying to get them into a representation that's useful um, and that perhaps shows relationships between things. So for example, is the two other two numbers of an amount close to each other? Or is, uh, for example, if you're taking uh, some words, like is laundry and clothing and understanding the similarity between those words? We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. What we do is we take all of those different features, um, of which there are many more than I've got on the screen here, um, and we combine those different, and we call them feature heads. Um, uh, essentially, we concatenate them all together. Um, we compress them. Uh, and then we process them. Um, uh, we sort of ramp that up to the size of your taxonomy. So if you have 300 categories, then it's ramping up to that. Um, and then the final sort of structure depends on, in our instance, we have three levels of, tax, uh, of classification. So one, two, three. Um, you might want to sort of decide one and then decide the next one based on the result from the first one. So for example, are your uh, categories hierarchical? or are they independent, or are they feeding up, or are they feeding down, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's where you get your feature heads from. From your feature heads, you then take a softmax um, over the taxonomy size, um, and then essentially what you're doing is every uh, thing that you're trying to classify, so every category, um, basically has a percentage of confidence. Um, so for example, if we're taking this transaction here, we could take Walmart, for example, and it might say, uh, alongside the category of uh, like groceries, it might be uh, 0.8. And then all of the other categories would have, like might be 0.1 or 0.01 or so on and so forth. And then all of those numbers add up to one. And what that allows you to do is not just say, we think it is this. Oh, sorry, it doesn't just say, uh, it gives you the different things that you think it is and it allows you to determine what is good enough for being able to say this is X. So taking a, cat a transaction that says it's Walmart, you're saying 0.8 uh, groceries, 0.1 perhaps uh, something like uh, uh, shopping, um, and then 0.x of the others. So that even, and then you can say, well, actually anything over 0.7, we're confident enough to say that to a user that this is groceries, um, and so on. So. Jumping into description processing, and this is what I'm going to talk most about. So this is that string of text uh, that is kind of unstructured, kind of structured, uh, a bit of a weird one. Um, and it's a string of text, essentially. Um, the structure of it depends massively depending on data sources. So if you're getting a feed uh, from Visa or MasterCard, quite often you might get a very long string and it's delimited, so the first X characters are field uh, telling you the merchant name and so on and so forth. But the thing is when you've got multiple different credit card providers, you've got multiple different banks, perhaps if you're using uh, sort of an open banking provider, um, uh, if you have uh, just different internal systems are processing, processing this, stripping out things like uh, card numbers, you're gonna end, you can't rely on those very specific structures to tell you what's in those individual uh, things. And sometimes you have it in different orders and so on and so forth. So not only can you not rely on that structure and you have to sort of be able to identify what the things are in that structure, you also have to do a lot of data augmentation um, to prevent overfitting. So data augmentation is essentially where you're intentionally sort of making the data a bit more messy in order to uh, allow it to understand different forms of data in the future. Overfitting is where uh, a model is very good at uh, categorizing or, or working for exactly the data it's trained on, but it won't be very good at um, classifying anything outside of that. It's been, obviously it's been almost trained too well on the data that it's been trained on. 
Something I find interesting about this is, essentially, this is the field of natural language processing, right? Um, but if you look at that transaction description string, that doesn't, I wouldn't call that natural language, right? Like, I don't have any friends who talk like that. Um, I imagine most of you don't either. Um, but essentially, it is natural language processing. It's just understanding a different kind of language, different speech patterns, essentially. So jumping into description processing and sort of some of the different things that we're doing there. So the first thing we're trying to do is bidirectional tokenization. Um, what does that mean? When you have that transaction description string, you want to essentially break it down to individual tokens. Um, now, and then so you can work on those individual tokens and sort of identify them and, and add sort of uh, detail to each of them individually. This is super important because it, what it does is it introduces almost a, um, an upper ceiling on the performance of your model. Um, if you take, if you have the word uh, funeral, for example, in your transaction description, and you tokenize and you chop, chop that in the middle of the word, then you have fun. Now, fun and funeral have very different meanings. Similarly, if you take the word ox and box, um, if you just take the B off and your tokenization is incorrect, again, it completely changes the meaning. So it's not important just for coverage in terms of you know, maybe understanding Starbucks, but like chopping it off the, the word Starbucks in half. It also actually can lead to erroneous uh, and incorrect results, which can be really bad if accuracy is important, for example, affordability and so on. So accuracy as well as coverage is really important that you're able to divide that transaction description into the right tokens. Secondly, and this is one of the most important things about taking something into a new market, is all about word embeddings. So what are word embeddings? Word embeddings is essentially where you're taking these words of a transaction description, uh, or these strings, these sets of characters, and you're trying to turn that into a numerical vector. Um, now, there's a lot of uh, discussion, and, uh, and everyone's talking about generative AI and everything else, and one of the things that everyone's talking about is how do you now represent a lot of your data as vectors? Um, and word embeddings is your, basically your way of trying to take text and try and understand that as a vector um, uh, and what it kind of means. Um, now, part of that is being able to understand the similarity between different types of words. Um, so, for, for example, if we take the word king and queen, they're both similar. They're both different names for a monarch. Um, but you'll also notice that man and woman, so man is closer to king and woman is closer to queen. Because you're turning these things into vectors, you can also determine the distance between different words, aka how related are they, how similar are they. Um, and this is how all these different models that we think about in terms of understanding one word from another, whereas one word should follow another, or the similarity between words, or what words actually mean, and that's where it really kind of comes from. If we think about how as humans, if we don't know the meaning of a word, what do we do? And these days, we type into Google, define the word, and then it gives us a whole bunch of other words to describe what that words mean, what word means. We use words to describe words, and this is kind of how computers can do that. So when we're coming up with these word embeddings, the first thing we do is, and you can take a lot of this kind of off the shelf as sort of unsupervised learning or pre-training. Um, from uh, there are a lot of corpuses online, uh, so. And this is, again, a big topic at the moment, is what data can you and can't you use for your corpuses for, for trying to be able to train your models? Um, Wikipedia is a really common source for being able to just train something to understand the language. Um, and that's great when you're speaking English. But if you're trying to translate, if you're trying to create a model in a language that is less common or has a much smaller Wikipedia, you're having to look at potentially other sources to just get an understanding of how does this language work, like which words relate to other words. Now, so what we do is we quite often take those sort of unsupervised uh, kind of corpuses or pre-trained sort of sets of understanding of language. Um, we make a, our own adjustments to that. Um, and as we're going into new markets, one of the key things we look at is, OK, what kind of pre-training look exists out there? But also, if we're going to go and do that ourselves, what kind of corpuses exist that allow us to be able to teach a computer to get a grasp and an understanding of that language? For example, Wikipedia, but there are others. So now we've got an understanding of all of these words as they relate to human language and English language. But as I was kind of saying earlier, no one really talks like those transaction description strings, right? Um, that's, that's not how we talk on, that's not how we write things on Wikipedia. So now it kind of has an understanding of what words might be related to other words. 
but it needs to be able to also understand that in the context of, in this instance, transactional data. So essentially what we're doing then is we are combining, adjusting, adding, creating our own custom embeddings. So we're trying to give a sense of the word that Uber is related to taxi, for example. Um, the, uh, that's not necessarily something that you might have in your usual definition of the English language, although I would say Uber is fairly well known as a term now in the same way that Google for like search engine. Um, but essentially you're trying to look at those different things. And the way we're able to do this is mostly sort of what we call self-supervised, which is where uh, it's not unsupervised, where you just leave a model to do its own thing. It's where it's essentially uh, able to, um, uh, it's able to sort of understand whether it did the right thing or not when it's sort of training the model. And then also during training of a model, um, you, when you're training a model, things change, like your weights change and so on and so forth. Um, and one thing you can do while training is you can essentially either freeze or unfreeze your word embeddings. So you can say these word embeddings are fixed, like don't suddenly start to change your understanding of the language. Um, and we see really interesting examples of this, and there was a paper published a few days ago where uh, uh, LLMs were starting to invent words um, that have no meaning to any of us. But if you used it in the exact same context of another word that would normally be in English, it would understand what it meant. So it would give you the exact same uh, uh, answer. Um, so for example, you could take the word gobbledygook um, and it might think if you put that as an input and it might relate that to the word tent. Um, but you, we were seeing this across multiple different models. Essentially these languages inventing models. And that's quite often what happens when you unfreeze. Um, so generally speaking, you'll freeze your, your word embeddings when you're training a model. What we'll quite often do is actually sometimes unfreeze our word embeddings when we're going into a new market. Um, so that we can customize it to that market data um, and really kind of get an understanding of what are the nuances of that market. Um, yeah. um, and then the final thing um, in description processing is around your actual model architecture. Now, <clears throat> there are lots of, I feel like right now, um, where everyone's very focused on GPT, on Palm 2, really exciting. Uh, it's obviously new, new LLMs. Um, based on the transformer model architecture that Google uh, announced sort of, what, six, seven years ago. Um, but it's not the only way of having an LLM. Um, LLMs have kind of existed, especially conceptually, since about 1997. Google Brain did some stuff in 2011 um, with recur uh, recurrent neural networks, RNNs. Um, now, the advantage of a transformer architecture is that it can look at the entire thing at once. It doesn't sort of just work through uh, sequentially. The advantage of that is that it gives you more parallel processing. Um, now at Bud, uh, we've been doing this since before transformer architecture. Um, uh, so uh, even today, we still look at both LSTMs, RNNs, uh, sort of bi uh, bi-directional RNNs, um, as well as sort of transformer model architectures. And we actually use them in different places. Sometimes we use transformer architectures. Sometimes we use RNN-based architectures. Um, it really depends on your use case, what you're trying to do. There are different trade-offs, there are different advantages to both um, when it comes to speed, when it comes to uh, the cost of running the model, for example, um, and how quickly and how much data you're training on. Um, but you can do both. Um, I'm not gonna tell you which one we do at Bud because it's not really relevant to the talk. Um, uh, but essentially, you've got different options there. Um, and the, co the most important thing is constantly trying different ones and seeing what makes the most sense for your use case. <clears throat> so when you're doing a classification problem, uh, when you're dealing with a, a categorization engine in this instance, um, and you're going and training it, a really, the easiest way to think of it is as a really constrained machine learning problem, right? You're not trying to create um, something that's gonna produce content. Um, you're not trying to get it to create new content. It's not something that's gonna create art, um, for example. The, you have a really constrained set of outputs. You have your taxonomy. Um, now, what that means is you want to also, when you're training your model, um, you want to probably do it in a supervised way that is essentially linking your inputs and being able to train to understand these are the kind of questions that you might be asked, and these are the answers that you would give in these examples, right? Um, it's almost uh, like when you're at school teaching by example rather than being taught um, uh, an abstract way of calculating something. 
um, and then being able to extrapolate from that to be able to see new types of data. And this is one of the differences between using like a rules-based model or um, uh, a merchant database or something like that, for example, is you want to be able to see things and understand things that you haven't seen before, but you also do, you don't want to get like new types of output. You don't want it to invent a new category, for example, or a new, or a new classification. So when you're doing that, uh, one of the best ways that we've kind of found is uh, what we think is makes sense here is labeling with that taxonomy in mind, and that's really important. Now, when you're doing that, you need really high quality training data. Um, <coughs> sorry. You need really high quality training data. Uh, so we built our own labeling tool. I think there's actually a talk on uh, sort of labeling of data, um, maybe tomorrow. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into detail of this, um, but I definitely recommend sort of checking it out. Um, uh, but you know, from our perspective, we essentially built a tool around this. Um, we give labelers a whole load of training uh, on exactly what that means. Um, uh, you know, we have things like a fine-tuned GPT model, sort of when you see a transaction and you're labeling it, um, to be able to sort of do searches and try and help get context. Um, but the other key thing is being able to have labelers that have like local knowledge. And this is where sort of from a market perspective, it becomes really important. You can't just take a bunch of, uh, a bunch of people who live in Australia, for example, and suddenly expect them to train a model based on Spanish data from Spain. Um, they don't necessarily have the context of what are the different merchants there? Um, what are the different like local customs? Um, what do sometimes different words mean? Or if they don't even know the language, it's really difficult. Now, when you train your first model, the chances are that your data scientists and your data analysts who are working on the model also understand the language themselves. It's a lot easier for, to be able to validate and train and kind of, uh, when you're kind of going through that process, when you already understand it. When you don't necessarily have uh, a data scientist sort of working on the model who understands Spanish, but they're training a model to be able to understand Spanish data, it becomes even more important that you have really, really high quality labeled data. Um, and that's kind of a really key thing there. And I'll talk a bit about uh, how we sort of help deal with that in a moment. So when you're going and labeling all of this data, um, you first of all need to understand like what data you need to label. Um, and one of the key things here is around um, uh, deduplication. So when you're training the model, you don't just want to be able to train on the statistical distribution of, of like where people spend money, right? Otherwise, you'll end up categorizing Uber and Walmart, and it will cat identify those things really, really, really well, but it's not going to identify the Moonshine Grill. Uh, that's a bar, a food place around the corner. It's really good, by the way. I checked it out yesterday. Um, it's not going to be able to identify that, because there aren't many people going and buying things from the Moonshine Grill compared to Walmart. What you want to do is you want to train your model based on features. Um, you want it to be able to understand as many different merchants, as many different uh, experiences, as many different like, types of a transaction as possible. So deduplicating those transactions essentially allows you to focus more on the features that you're actually trying to train the model for rather than just try and teach it the state of the world. And this is, again, a big difference, whereas like, when you're training an LLM for uh, a purpose of being able to understand natural language, um, where actually it makes sense to potentially train it on the statistical distribution of data. <clears throat> the second thing is uh, around active learning. So one of the key things when you're going into a new market, if you're doing this a lot, is you need it to be uh, as cheap as possible, right? Like you can't just suddenly, if you say it takes you a million label transactions to, to produce like a, re a reasonable quality model, um, that's an awful lot of people time, like labeling, right? You don't want it to be super expensive. You want to make it as easy as possible, but being able to get the highest quality. So active learning is where, when you're essentially deciding what to label, you're going for the transactions that are uh, going to have the most impact on the model itself. So again, if we kind of, it's very similar to deduplication, but not quite the same. Um, so for example, you might take, and there are many different strategies of doing this. You could be like run through a set of transactions. And for those that would have like lower confidences or that the model hasn't seen before, you then prioritize the labeling of those. Again, you're trying to under get the model in its training to understand the broadest set of features possible and not just the same thing over and over and over again. So then we come to, come to consensus labeling. Um, we didn't used to do consensus labeling when we were just in one market. We didn't need to. Um, 
our, our, our labels are generally of a high enough quality. And to go back to the point earlier, when you've got your data scientists and data analysts understanding the context, understanding the market already, you, you kind of have those extra layers. When you don't have those kind of same kind of protections, you need to kind of come up with other ways of doing it. So consensus labeling is the idea of taking one transaction, instead of just labeling it once from one person and assuming that that label is correct, um, you might try and understand, actually, I want to sort of see do multiple people agree that that's the correct label for that transaction? Now, you don't necessarily need to do that for every single transaction. Um, if every single time, so say that there are 100 Uber transactions in our data set, um, different transactions, they're all kind of similar, but a bit different. Um, we don't need every single one of those 100 transactions for Uber, where someone's classified it as a taxi service um, or pu public car, uh, car hire or whatever. Um, you don't need every single one of those individuals to, uh, transactions to be labeled three times by three people to be like, yeah, okay, it's a taxi. Um, on the other hand, if there is a transaction where perhaps like the labeler spent a lot longer trying to, before they actually inputted what they thought the label was, AKA it was probably more difficult for them to label, um, or if it's a transaction that we don't have many other similar transactions to, um, then it's actually probably more important for us to try and gain that consensus around what that label should be. If you have one transaction in your, in, in your training set about the Moonshine Grill, you wanna make sure that you've labeled it really well and it's a really high quality label, as opposed to if you've got five transactions, for example. So that's where consensus labeling comes in, but being really clever and dynamic with how you manage that, uh, when you need consensus and how much consensus you need. And that's a great way of being able to make sure your labels are of a high enough quality that you can trust them when you're going into a new market. And then the final point on here around is clustering. So we use this both in uh, the consensus labeling, but also independently. Um, are there similar transactions that have been labeled differently? So for example, do we have 80 transactions um, of which of uh, Uber transactions, but five of them were labeled differently. If so, why were they labeled differently? And trying to understand that, um, because it may be that actually there's a feature in there that we're not missing, that, uh, that we're missing that those five are different. Um, a good example of this is in the UK, um, a lot of supermarkets uh, are also have uh, gas stations. Um, so there's a, a large supermarket chain in the UK called Tesco's, um, Tesco's and Tesco Petrol. Um, there is a difference between those, right? And you're gonna have less Tesco petrol transactions than you will Tesco's. You wanna be able to understand the difference there. Um, so are they different for a reason or are they different because there are low, lower quality labels? So being able to understand that. So the task, we're taking this to a new market. Um, so what, what, are, what are we doing? Um, we're taking a domain focused LLM. Um, we are, it's currently based on, say in this example, it's based on one language, it's based on one market with the sort of all the regional specific, uh, specificities that come with that. Um, it's built on a set of supervised training data. Um, and we want to easily add compatibility for a new market. So whether or not you're training an entirely separate model that's gonna look at this new market, or whether or not you're trying to have a new model that will tackle, that will be able to categorize data from both markets, um, it's not entirely dissimilar from what we're kind of talking through. So one of the things you have to do is define success. Um, uh, at risk of, you know, uh, I'm, my, my background is engineering, but from a product perspective, you can't just sort of be like, hey, we built a thing and it works, right? Like you need to understand like what good looks like. Um, and when you're doing this with models and particularly categorization, um, there are four measures uh, that are commonly used. And bizarrely, the one that, uh, I imagine the least people have heard of, which is F1, is probably actually the best measure. So to take this diagram that we have kind of up here, um, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see essentially the, uh, does this work? No, laser pointer doesn't work. Um, this does so. Um, so what you can see on this side over here is, uh, so say if we're classifying if something is a grocery store. Um, Everything, all these sort of little dots on this side, these are grocery stores. So that's grocery store, that's a grocery store, and so on and so forth. Everything on this side is not a grocery store. Um, simple and easy to understand. Um, now, everything inside the circle is where we uh, predicted um, the true positives is where we said it was a grocery store. False positives is where we said it's a grocery store, but it's not a grocery store. Uh, the false negatives, it is a grocery store, but we didn't, we, we just said we don't know. 
Um, and true negatives is where um, uh, it wasn't a grocery store and we didn't think it was a grocery store. So uh, you have sort of four different measures. So accuracy. This is probably the one that we all think of the most, right? Like, and obviously makes the most sense, which is very simple. What proportion of the predictions were correct? Great. So say, for example, that we are not um, looking at grocery stores, but instead we are, uh, it's, a, it's a test for a disease, right? And say that 10 people have this disease um, uh, out of a population of 20. And we only make predictions for two of them. And we say one of these people has a disease and one of them doesn't. And everyone else, we're just like, we don't know. That's not really very good performance of the model, is it, right? Like, the ideal of the performance of the model is you identify the 10 people that have the disease, um, you don't m you miss anyone out, and you don't include anyone extra. Um, so accuracy isn't really particularly helpful in that instance, because the accuracy would be 100% on that model, the only that identified one person as having disease and one person not having disease, despite the fact that 10 people have the disease. So accuracy, not too great. Precision. So precision is around, out of the guesses I made, how many of them were correct? Um, how many of the retrieved items are relevant? So that's essentially where you're trying to figure out, um, uh, you're essentially taking your true positives over the number of predictions you made. So in this instance, say that I predicted one person has it and one person doesn't, 50%, um, 50%, uh, um, uh, uh, because the other half are false positives, that's where I was, that's where I was, where, where I was wrong. Then we have recall. So how many relevant items are retrieved? So in this instance, if we identify one person having the disease, but there are 10 people that have the disease, that's 10%. So recall is 10% in that example. However, recall would be 100% if we, said 10, if we said 10 out of 10. However, if we took the entire sample of, of people, if we took every single person who has the disease, um, uh, and everyone who doesn't, and we said 100% of them have the disease, then that will be 100% as well. So then you have F1, which is essentially a combination of your recall and your precision. Um, uh, essentially brings those things together, like how good is your model actually at being able to achieve the right outcomes? How good is it at not at being able to uh, identify as much as possible in the category that you're looking for, identify as many grocery stores in the set of grocery stores, but also not be bad at saying, well, I think these ones are grocery stores, um, uh, and actually they're not. So uh, with that, um, defining success, um, uh, I appreciate that was quite a lot of context for, for these things that we're trying to think about. Um, so what do we define success as when we're going into a new market? Two things, one, we want a high quality model, and these are our different metrics that we now have, right? Accuracy, F1, precision, and recall, with F1 being the most important one. And then second of all, you also want it to be easy, right? Um, entering a new market, if you want to enter a new European market, for example, um, there are a significant number of countries in the EU, for example, every single one of them speaks a different language, or most of them speak different languages. Um, if it's a huge amount of time and resource and expenditure um, to go into every single one of those new markets, it's, it's not really successful. You want it to be as easy as possible to enter those new markets, but you also need to make sure that when you're doing it, you're producing something that's really high quality. So that's defining success, right? High quality, but also as easy as possible to do. So I've already talked about some of the things that we already do, um, uh, uh, but to kind of go into depth into a couple more of them, more of them. Um, so your first challenge when you're entering a new market is potentially around language. Um, a lot of different uh, um, uh, countries will have a different language. Sometimes it's the same. Obviously, like the US and the UK, you speak the same language. It's not as much of an issue. Um, the only thing you have to kind of get around is the Zs instead of Ss and that kind of thing, um, which I've tried to fix in my slides. I apologize if there are any uh, 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 rogue Ss in there. Um, so in this instance, and we talked a bit about word embeddings earlier, the model understands that laundry and clothing are related, right? Um, and it understands the relationship between them as close. Now, when you're going into a new language, so in this instance, I'm using Spanish, um, uh, you want to understand that uh, lavado, which is laundry in Spanish, and, and ropa are also related. You want to understand these two new words, and you want to be able to create a relationship between these two new words. Um, it's just, it should be the same relationship as between laundry and clothing. 
But even better, you probably also want to understand the different uh, that uh, Leverdo and clothing are related. You want to understand and be able to use the training data you potentially already have from an existing market in your new market. It means you don't need as much training data when you go into that new market because you already suddenly have this understanding of, well, clothing and laundry are related and laundry and laundry are related in the two respective languages. So therefore, anything that's related to laundry and the categorization and the links to our taxonomy and our predictions that we made off the back of that, you can now use all of the predictions that your existing model would have done. And you've essentially just turned it into a new and, uh, and told it and translated it into a new language. Now, doing that through word embeddings um, is the key thing, right? Like you're trying to create similarity between words. Um, so, when, um, uh, when you're trying to do this and trying to create these new word embeddings, first of all, I mentioned about being able to understand between the difference between Lovedo and Roper, like laundry and, and clothing. Um, that kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of being able to find those corpuses of text um, or pre-training um, that you can do based off of that. And again, this is easier for some languages than for others. Um, uh, Wikipedia being, again, a common one. Um, so that's where you kind of are starting, your starting point, like trying to, un how do I understand the new language and how do I understand the new language in the context of the new language, right? Um, you don't want to be going and typing define Laverdo into, uh, or wrote define Ropa into, uh, into Google, and then it gives you the response in English. You almost want the Spanish version of that, right? So you can describe Spanish in Spanish. You then want to potentially blend your embeddings. Um, uh, so you have sort of your, your, uh, existing embeddings that you already have. You have your new embeddings in the new language, um, but you also want to be able to map between embeddings. Um, and this is, you can use something called Procrustean alignment um, to do that. So Procrustean alignment um, is, yeah, exactly that, trying to essentially map between your embeddings. Um, uh, so you're able to understand the relationship between this set of embeddings you have over here and these similarities between over here. So English model over here, Spanish model over here, map them together. Um, and then I kind of already mentioned this a little bit earlier, but also unfreezing uh, your embeddings when you're training in the new model as well. Like you want to, the whole point is you want to be able to understand that things aren't necessarily the same. Things aren't necessarily the same from one market to another. And you want to be able to take those, uh, those learnings and those bits of training um, into your model. So being able to tell it, actually, I do want to let you change your understanding of the language and that's perfectly fine, because otherwise you might end up with erroneous results. So then we kind of get to regionality. Um, now, regionality uh, kind of becomes our, our second challenge in you have to understand your new region. Um, it's not just a case of a new language. Um, a really good example of this is uh, um, different terms that are perhaps used for different things um, uh, or different ways that people are paid. So for example, in the US, um, you sometimes have fortnightly salaries, but you also sometimes have monthly salaries. In the UK, it's, uh, sal salaries are almost always monthly. In New Zealand, they're almost always fortnightly, right? So those different pieces of information are giving you important context. Um, uh, and you can't just assume that it's gonna be the same in every market, but also you want to understand those intricacies so you can feed that in as features. Um, now, when you're also sort of going through and doing your word embeddings and trying to understand your data, you don't wanna throw out everything you already know. Um, you want to be able to use that existing training and word embeddings to sort of pre-train your model. You don't wanna to have to need one million transactions for every new region. You wanna be able to be like, well, I already have a model in one region. Maybe I can go and train a new model in a new region with only 500,000 transactions and use the one million that I've already used in this other region. They're less important, but they're still giving you a, a, essentially a sense of uh, relationships. Um, and when it comes to global parties, um, and by parties I mean merchants, but also payment processors like uh, Square or PayPal, for example, um, those don't change necessarily between uh, you know, the US and the UK, for example. So being able to sort of keep your understanding of those in that context is super helpful. Um, and then finally, coming, coming down to human labeling, like finding people from the local market, finding people that really understand that data, and then using that consensus labeling um, to make sure that you've got those really accurate and those really high quality labels. 
So uh, with that, um, over to any questions. Um, I think there's a microphone um, if anyone wants to stand up, but otherwise you can just yell at me um, and I can repeat it for the recording. Go for it. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a really good question. The, um, the truth of it is that you understand that it's ambiguous and getting an understanding of what is ambiguous is really important because it's not, one word can mean two different things, but also one merchant, for example, might also be two different things. Um, if you think about, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, uh, I mentioned Walmart earlier, right? You might go and use it for sort of miscellaneous shopping. You might go and buy a TV from, from Walmart, um, but you also might go and get your groceries from Walmart. So, but those are different categories and different, um, so understanding what is ambiguous, um, and that's just, you can get that from the labeling process. So one of the things we do during labeling is, we're like, this is ambiguous or this is difficult, but also, you will often see, with then I mentioned about clustering, you'll quite often see different people labeling it in the same way, uh, in different ways. Um, but the other side of that is that around word embeddings. So when you take a, 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 a homonym where, uh, um, or, or similar, you know, where it's, where it's words that sound, sound the same and uh, uh, sort of spelled differently or whatever, um, what you'll quite often see is that those words will then have um, very specific uh, ways that they're related to the other languages. So in the same way, if you type define, um, I'm struggling to think of a homonym in my head, but um, uh, if, you def if you type define into Google, it gives you a couple of different definitions, right? So it's understanding and it's like, I've got these two relationships here with essentially these other, these definitions. Um, it may be that one is a closer um, relationship um, because that's the more common usage of the word, and this is also where it's important to understand your context and your domain, because it may be that that homonym in some situations is, um, is more likely to mean one meaning than the other, and it's very obvious from that, from the domain that you're working in, right, or the context that you have. Um, so being able to take those sort of default embeddings, understanding of the language, understanding what's common in the English language, but then being able to fine tune and, and, uh, and tweak it down to what is relevant for you and relevant for your domain. There isn't really a good answer is, is, is the truth of it. Um, uh, and it's a really difficult problem, but yeah, understanding ambiguity and then also trying to understand the, the, the distance between sort of uh, relationships in, in your domain. Yeah, of course. Um, so the question to repeat it for the, the camera um, uh, was why is F1 more important than, than accuracy or precision? Um, essentially, F1 is it's uh, it's the harmonic mean of accuracy and oh, sorry of precision and recall. Um, so essentially, what it's doing is it's saying the most important thing is to be good rather than being accurate. If that makes sense. Um, so you want to, if you're a politician and you don't know the answer to the question, the best way to deal with that situation is just not to answer the question, right? But nobody thinks that that's a good answer to the question, right? Because you didn't answer the question. Um, but you were 100% accurate. <laughs> um, and in this situation, it's, it's a very similar kind of, and I, you know, obviously, uh, past few years with COVID testing and so on and so forth, there's been a lot of debate and, and discussion in, in public forums around um, accuracy of tests and that kind of thing. And again, one of the points here is everyone's talking about, well, what if it's a false negative or it's a false positive and so on and so forth? You're like, I just want the COVID test to tell me if I have COVID or not, right? And I want it to be, uh, every single time that I do it, I want to know if, I, if, if I've, I'm positive for COVID. Um, so it's being, the F1 is the closest thing you can get to, is it just good rather than is it accurate, if that makes sense. Um, I appreciate that all the definitions are kind of 
similar-ish, um, uh, hence trying to explain it with a diagram. Does that make a bit more sense? No, thank you. Go for it. Yeah, I think, so in that situation, th there's always gonna be data that you can't categorize, right? Um, and it's like, I just don't have enough information here to tell me what category this is. Um, and again, to go back to our, our different definitions of success, one of the important things there is not to, is, is, is to understand uh, what those, uh, you know, oh, I know that I don't know this, um, uh, for example, and, and, and holding your hand up to say, I don't know this rather than being necessarily inaccurate. Um, but on the, other, on the other hand, the way you really want to be is being able to identify as many of those situations as possible, right? And this is where, um, again, this is, this is on, on the specifically using um, LLMs for categorization where it's much better than using a merchant database because a merchant database, you're only ever gonna be identify like matching against your database, whereas when you're using an LLM for it, um, you're able to take other attributes. So for example, you can do things, uh, when, you're, when you're transferring money for your rent, for example, um, uh, when I transfer my money to my rent, the transaction description is normally, is like the first line of my address, um, uh, and then I transfer it to a random bank account, uh, sort code and account number. So in that instance, what we're doing there is we're like, well, if someone's put their address as a transaction description, the chances are is that that's actually one of these other categories. Um, right, so you, you can't match a merchant to that because it doesn't tell you the name, you know, my, my, where, where uh, my estate agent is, is called uh, Savills. That's not anywhere in there. Um, but the fact that we're able to see the address, we're able to see the amount, um, we're able to see things like the regularity and so on and so forth, um, and different features of that mean, we could be like, actually, that's probably someone's rent. Um, and we know that the UK market, that's a really common thing to do is to put um, someone's uh, first line of their address in as, uh, um, uh, as a transaction description for rent, we almost never see that for utility bills. For utility bills, it's much more likely, for example, to go to uh, like an omnibus account. Um, so something where um, uh, sort of a, a big sort of holding account, um, a way with an account number, for example, as your reference. Um, so being able to understand the features that aren't just the merchant name and be able to use that in identifying whether or not something is and what category it is, is the big difference between using a model for this and being able to use a database, if that makes sense. Uh, did I repeat the question for the mic? I can't remember if I did. Uh, the question uh, was um, uh, how do, how do I don't, how, using an LLM, how do you identify transactions um, where the uh, transaction description doesn't immediately give away, uh, maybe doesn't have any information like a merchant in it um, uh, to try and identify a category. Any more questions? Great, all right, well thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say massive thanks to uh, all the sponsors, um, all the staff, um, everyone who's put the, uh, the event together, um, from sound to, to, to move and so on. Um, so massive thank you, thank you for having me. Um, looking forward to spending the next few days in Austin. Um, if any of you want to chat more about this, um, feel free to come chat to me, um, talk to me about LLMs, um, we can geek out a bit on it, or if you want to talk to me about what Bud does, that too. Um, so yeah, I'll be around for the next few days, just come find me, um, I don't bite. Thank you very much.